Welcome to Medical Matters Weekly with Dr. Trey Dobson, presented by Southwestern Vermont Healthcare and Catamount Access Television. Today is February 9th, 2022. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. My guest today is Caitlin Boyd. Uh, through her work at SVMC's Pulmonary Rehabilitation Program, she helps patients breathe better. Caitlin's bio, um, she has a bachelor's degree in nutrition and food science from the University of Vermont, a doctorate of physical therapy, so DPT from UVM. She helped create the Pulmonary Rehabilitation Program at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, I believe in 2015. And she is certified in pulmonary rehab by the American Association for Respiratory Care and the American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehabilitation. That was a lot. Uh, Caitlin, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, you're welcome. It's great to be here. So do people say DPT? Did I say that right? Yeah, yep, yep. That's awesome. Where are you right now? I am at our clinic up in Wilmington, so uh, the Deerfield campus of SVMC. So two days a week, I do physical therapy up here. And then the other three, I'm in Bennington, mostly in pulmonary rehab. But I do spend some time in our PT department over in the Tulane building. How many locations uh, are there in the health system? Um, there's the Deerfield campus, Northshire campus. Huh. Connell, Twin Rivers, uh, our main campus. Um, I so, think several, we, so several. Yeah, most. I think we have PT in all of them. We might just have OT in Ponell. I'm not sure that we've ever had physical therapy right. down there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, that's great. And so you've got some machines and stuff behind you. Maybe later you can kind of tell us what those things are. But let's, okay. let me just ask you about you personally. So you've been here. When did you come to SVMC? Uh, 2011. So just before Hurricane Irene happened, I was here for two weeks and then Irene happened and I was actually living in Wilmington at the time. So uh -huh. they, they got really hard hit. So I actually like couldn't get to Bennington because the bridge washed out right. there in Woodford. So I had to live with my aunt and a friend in North Adams for two weeks to even get to work. So that was an adventure. Wow. So that's a really memorable way to start off uh, your career in the health system. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah. so, so where were you, where did you grow up then? Did you grow up in Wilmington? Uh, no, I grew up in Reedsboro, so okay. small town east of Bennington, kind of next door to Wilmington. I went to high school in Wilmington, and then did, I went to college up at UVM, like you said. Okay, and then how did you get interested in this field? Let's hear the story. Um, I went to UVM undecided and I took an anatomy and physiology course and I really liked it. And so I started looking at what I could do with that. Um, they have a great med school program, but I was like, I don't think I want to do med school. Um, my mom and aunt are nurses and they love it, but I was like, I don't think nursing's for me. I'd always been an athlete. And so I realized they had a physical therapy program. I, I thought I would end up working with athletes actually, but um, Around that time, like my grandmother was doing some physical therapy, my friend had an ACL repair, so I went to some of her sessions, and I just, UVM had this great program where you could do your undergrad in three years, and then your PT schooling in three years, and so I was able to get it done pretty quickly. It's it's intense, but it was only six years, and um, yeah, and only it was transitioning from a master's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was transitioning from a master's to a doctorate, so I thought that was exciting, too, to you know, come out, we, we were like the second class to graduate with our doctorate. So that was cool. So yeah, it's really cool. So you so let's see, let me think about this. So you went to UVM your first year, you took that anatomy and physiology course. And then was it six years from that point that you got your DPT? No, because I was able to take like the prereqs and some sciences that first year. So um, and I was able to like apply and I was accepted into the program. So as long as I had certain grades, I could just transition into it. So it worked out. It, it was hard my senior year because that was everyone else's senior year, but it was actually my first year of PT school. So, you know, everyone was having a good time and I was in this really intense, you know, we were taking anatomy and phys and neuroscience with the med students. So <laughs> it was quite different senior year for me. Yeah, I can imagine. Why don't you tell us, so what is pulmonary rehabilitation? 
So pulmonary rehab is an education and exercise program. It's designed to help you understand your chronic lung disease. Um, it's designed to improve shortness of breath, improve your quality of life, um, teach you how to manage your condition. Um, you know, it's comprehensive. So we have on physical therapy, we have respiratory therapy, we have nurses that help us. Um, Dr. Algas, our pulmonologist, oversees it. So it's really, you know, there's there's multiple parties that are involved in it. And most everyone that goes in and gets the, um, you know, pulmonary rehab type cert certification, are they almost all coming from physical therapy? Is that the path that is, that is the most common? No, I would say there's definitely respiratory therapy as well. So um, some hospitals, it's mm -hmm. just respiratory therapy that is involved in the program. Um, so actually when we were establishing it and we went to observe a couple of programs, it was actually a respiratory therapist that I, I shadowed with for the day and helped us create ours. And so um, I would say it's a mix between like physical therapy and respiratory therapy. Are you doing um, exclusively pulmonary rehab or do you still do some of the uh, mechanical portions of physical therapy that people think about musculoskeletal? Yeah, so I still do regular physical therapy. Um, the days that I'm here in our uh, Deerfield campus, it's uh, you know just anything, whether it's your shoulder, your back, balance. Um, and I do vestibular rehab. So it has to do with your inner ear and how that affects your balance. Um, so I do that here in Wilmington, but I also do it over um, in the Tulin building. And then outside of that, you know, I'd say half of my time is in pulmonary. I, wow, I'm glad you brought up vestibular because I think there's probably actually a lot of referring uh, physicians that don't know uh, that, that uh, vestibular uh, rehab is actually available at SVMC. Yeah, so there's actually three therapists that do it, and um, we've really worked hard in the past few years to try to wear, raise awareness, so there's much more than there ever used to be, um, but right. every so often we kind of get out there and put the bug back into the primary care doctors, like, hey, we're here and we can do it, and the ER, you know, when we had physical therapy in the ER, we were getting some referrals if people were coming in for that, and we try to get them set up that next week with us. Um, so, so that's, well, that's great. We can actually do a whole show on vestibular, vestibular rehab as well. So back to pulmonary. So what are some of these chronic lung diseases uh, that you see and that patients experience that require pulmonary rehab? Yeah. So the most common is COPD. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So pulmonary rehab is the gold standard for treatment of um, COPD along with medication. Um, but research has actually supported, um, you know, pulmonary rehab for all types of other uh, lung conditions. So asthma, pulmonary fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, even people who are either currently going through lung cancer treatment or who have um, completed, you know, whether it's surgery or chemo and radiation um, to try to get, you know, um, to improve their breathing and their function. Um, and actually, most recently, there's a lot of research to support patients after COVID-19. Um, so that's what's kind of changed in the last year or so is actually helping people who have long COVID or people who are hospitalized and, you know, not doing as well. Um, so, so that's been the newest change is the COVID-19 patients. Right. So, so these are patients that have had some type of insult to either the upper respiratory tract or more likely to the alveoli and their capacity, their respiratory capacity is just not what it was. So they come to you and you try to help with that. So walk me through that situation. Actually, let's not use a COVID patient. Let's, let's use a, a patient who has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, and they are referred to you. So what, what uh, steps are involved and what will they experience? Yeah, so the first session is an orientation. So I get to know them, their medical history, and then specifically their respiratory history. So, you know, how long have they known about COPD? What medications are they taking? Are they using oxygen? Um, and then trying to get a measure of like their functional status, like what makes them short of breath? What are they having trouble doing? Are they still able to work? Have they stopped working? Um, and then, uh, we do what's called a six minute walk test in the hallway. So it's a measure of their endurance and they can take breaks because 
for some people, the idea of walking for six minutes is very scary. And even if you can just do a lap, we start with that. It's just wherever you are, we try to meet you there. And then it's just gentle, progressive exercise to try to improve your capacity. And so, you know, we teach you about first slip breathing and deep breathing on that first visit. Um, the the follow-up sessions, it's twice a week. It's about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, patients come in, we check their vital signs. So their blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen levels. We go through a warm up, which does include the breathing exercises. Um, that we have equipment. So some of, I'm not sure what you can see, but to my left, there is an arm bike. So a lot of people have not seen an arm bike before. Um, there are recumbent steppers and then treadmills. And if people are not comfortable on treadmills, we walk in the hallway and, you know, we just start out easy. People are very fearful of the idea of exercise. Like I, I can't breathe to even walk to my bathroom. How am I going to exercise? But even if you can just do a minute and then we build up from there. Um, and then, you know, people just kind of cool down and we check their vitals, um, before they leave. We are monitoring heart rate and oxygen throughout the whole time that they're exercising to make sure those are staying stable. Um, some people are coming to us and they're newly on oxygen. So we're monitoring, you know, what are their oxygen levels? How much do they need um, to have proper saturation? Um, so it's just, it's, it's making sure people are safe to exercise, building their confidence in exercise. And then while they're there, we're providing education. So what are the medicines you're taking? Are you using them correctly? Do you know about pacing yourself and energy conservation? Do you know about the purslip breathing and deep breathing? Um, we talk about nutrition, we talk about depression and anxiety. Um, you know, so it really covers a variety of things. How long do they typically stick with the program or how long do you recommend yeah. that? Yeah, our program runs for eight weeks. Um, so when we were creating the program, we looked at research and it was anywhere from like six weeks to 12 weeks. So we just started with the eight weeks. Um, pulmonary rehab, you get lifetime visits. So there's only 36 lifetime visits with Medicare. And so we thought if we use 16, it would give people a chance to get going. But then if they ever had an event, um, pneumonia or something that landed them back in the hospital, they would still have sessions later on if they needed it. Uh, and at the end of the eight weeks, people can transition to our maintenance program. So that's where they come in twice a week and they exercise more independently on our equipment um, because you want to continue the gains that you've made in those eight weeks. You don't want to just go back home and stop exercising. Um, some people are great. They'll get out walking every day. They have a treadmill at home that they start using again or a bike. And other people really like to come in because usually it's myself or our nurse that are running that and people can check in with us and, you know, we're just monitoring their health a little bit and um, people find that helpful. So, so you said, so let me back up and say, so you said about 32 to 36 um, sessions are covered. And yeah. When you, right. And then when you say that, that means by a payer in this case, Medicare, so that patients aren't, you know, paying out of pocket for this service, uh, health related service. And right. so since it's eight weeks, the typical session is twice a week. So there's where you can come up with 16 sessions yeah. if you go through the program yeah. once. Right. And then that allows you to, at some point in the future, come back for an additional eight, eight weeks. Correct. Wow, and that's great. Really, that's actually pretty intense. Yeah, it is. It is definitely. It's a very comprehensive program. And it, it's really designed to help you manage your lung condition. So like lifelong, you know, COPD doesn't go away, the damage that been caused, we can't, you know, heal that, we can't cure that. But if we can learn to use the part of our lungs that's still working well, and then also, you know, like our, our diaphragm is the muscle that we use to breathe. So um, when you have breathing problem, our diaphragm is not activated as well. So it's just like you can do a biceps curl and strengthen your biceps, you can strengthen your diaphragm as well. Oh, that's a great analogy. So talk to us a little bit about the outcomes, not only um, anecdotally what you've seen, because we'd love to hear that, uh, but what you know to be uh, the case from literature review and outcome studies. Yeah, so literature based, it's the gold standard of treatment for COPD, so along with medications, um, but then the research has supported it with all these other conditions, so lung cancer, interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, asthma, um, 
and then, you know, typically what we see is, is people, it's hard because people are short of breath and they don't think that exercise will help that. But if you learn to breathe while you're moving and then your heart and your lungs become more efficient at getting in the oxygen you need and getting it out to your muscles while you're moving, um, it actually becomes easier to move around. And then that becomes easier to walk around your house or do your stairs or get out to the grocery store. So people find that they can move around easier. Um, and then, you know, just quality of life, because you're not so short of breath just to sit there, you're able to do more for yourself. And so you feel better. It helps to improve mood. So anxiety and depression, because you're not just home focused on your breathing, you know, your, your breathing isn't controlling you, you're, you have some control over your breathing, and you have some say in your chronic disease, which makes a difference. People feel empowered, you know? Right. So you've, you've talked about there's, there's definitely a positive effect on decreasing morbidity. And by the word morbidity, I mean, uh, sort of similar to what you're saying, improving quality of life. Uh, yes. What about mortality? Is there data to suggest that pulmonary rehab decreases mortality? Um, I, I don't know on that. I mean, I know the research is out there with like smoking. So if uh, Medicare used to not cover pulmonary rehab if you were smoking, but now they've changed that. So if you are still smoking, but motivated to quit and we can provide some smoking cessation education um, and help you in that process of quitting that actually people are more likely to quit and um, follow through with that. And so, you know, the biggest thing with lung disease, because because typically COPD is, is caused by, you know, years of having smoked. So if people can stop smoking and then things like exercise, taking medication correctly, rather than their lung condition, just like rapidly, you know, declining, it's sort of this more gradual um, um, decline or people progressing to need needing oxygen. Sometimes we can stave that off or, you know, um, they were on three liters, but they can go down to one liter of oxygen. Um, right. So that's so important, that change uh, to allow people who are who wanting to stop smoking to start participating in pulmonary rehab, which may just be what they need to, to make that decision to stop smoking. And then in some of the other diseases you talked about that are not related to smoking, particularly the just restrictive lung diseases, even if uh, the data uh, does not show a mortality benefit, in other words, um, you know, uh, decreased numbers of, of deaths due to the underlying chronic condition, it certainly shows benefit as far as um, how you feel and how you go about your day, as you mentioned, and that is so important. In fact, I might even argue more important uh, than a mortality benefit. And we probably will know a little bit more on mortality once these programs mature and more data uh, becomes available over, over time. Uh, okay. It's really exciting. So talk to us a little bit about some of the um, individual successes you have experienced and, and been a part of. Yeah, so I had, I had one patient who was on oxygen, you know, she was on two years of oxygen, she was very frail, um, you know, barely was able to get herself dressed, take a shower, just kind of get around her house. Um, she came in, she was very afraid to exercise, but she was determined. And she just did that first day, she just did a minute. So she did a minute on the arm bike, a minute on the stepper and a minute of walking in the hallway. And then she said, every day I come, I'm gonna add a minute. And so she was able to, you know, our goal is to get you up to 20 minutes of exercise on each of the machines. So build up your endurance first and then um, increase the resistance. So whether that's, you know, pedaling against more resistance or walking up a slight hill on the treadmill or a faster speed. And so she was able to get to that 20 minutes on each machine and she was so proud of herself. And in turn, like mood improved, her ability to get out to her doctor's appointments. Um, you know, she was still using oxygen. She still required her two liters, but um, it was just more than she'd been able to do in years. So that, that was an exciting story for me. Um, I remember there was another gentleman that told me that I gave him his life back. Um, he was able to get back to work. So he hadn't been working in two years and with the program, um, he was just able to, to get back to work. And, you know, even when I would see him around town or in the hallway in the hospital, he would just always tell me that, like, that I gave him his life back. So that was exciting. That is just, that's fantastic. And for you as a, a healthcare uh, professional, to, to help people limit, limit their suffering and improve their quality of life is, 
Um, I know it's a lot of hard work. And by the way, I'll take use the opportunity to thank you and your colleagues and the entire uh, staff at SVMC that work so hard in pulmonary rehab and throughout all of physical therapy and occupational therapy. It does make a tremendous difference to these um, to the community and to the individuals. So thank you for that. Um, a couple of things. Let me just ask you real quick. What are, what are you looking forward to uh, personally and professionally over the next uh, year or two? Uh, well, personally, I have a one-year-old son. So Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah, watching him grow and um, hopefully when things settle down with COVID, spending time with our extended friends and family because we have large families. My husband and I have large families. And then um, professionally, I think just being able to continue to help the um, uh, the patients that have COVID. Um, so uh, that's just been an exciting arena. So, you know, I've seen some of the patients in the hospital that have been intubated and then have been able to come through our program um, and really improve their quality of life and get back to work and for some of them get off oxygen. And so, so that part's just exciting, um, you know, uh, seeing where we go with COVID and what we learn um, about it and, you know, who's able to, you know, improve and heal and, you know, figuring out why some people are more affected by it than others, b besides vaccination status, you know. Right, right. We certainly, Caitlin, had a, um, a guest about three or four shows ago who um, had, was a COVID survivor uh, in the ICU. And he did talk about how he still has, uh, even though he says he feels great in many ways, he still has diminished exercise capacity and, and diminished respiratory capacity. And that would be a, a super candidate, of course, for pulmonary rehab. And I believe he's actually going through that process. But uh, that is that is exciting. And you can actually build the program uh, and, again, make a difference in, in individuals' lives. And that's so important. What is the machine to behind you? Is that just so that, uh, is that actually a pulmonary machine to over your right shoulder, I believe? My now you're blocking right it. So here? No, other uh, side. Maybe it's your left is reversed. Oh, that machine right there. That's an ultrasound unit. And oh, I can't tell from there. Yeah, so that's physical therapy based. We don't really right. use so much in, in pulmonary. It's too I, I don't know if you can see. That is an arm bike. Um, wow. You might see it a little bit. So the, you know, we pedal with your arms rather than with your legs. So that's our fancy arm bike. And the goal is to get up to 20 minutes on that machine. Yes. And so because like our arm muscles have attachments to our rib cage, which is connected to our diaphragm, it really does challenge our diaphragm more than we realize, not just our arm muscles. Oh, wow. That's a great point. So, Caitlin, yeah. if, if myself or uh, one of my family members, uh, we feel like we need pulmonary rehab, what are the steps we take? Uh, so just talking with your primary care physician, uh, they can get you a referral. Um, if you have a pulmonologist, they can send in a referral. So really any any doctor, any provider that you see can um, refer you to the program. So primary care, you know, Dr. Algus is the pulmonologist here at SVNC or, you know, any, you see somebody up at Dartmouth or something like that. Um, they just get a referral. And then usually within a few days, I give you a call and we get an orientation scheduled as soon as possible. Well, I'd like to thank Kaylin so much for coming on the show and explaining to us all about pulmonary rehab. We'll have to have you, uh, next year. So you can talk about what's been going on with your COVID patients. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on Medical Matters Weekly, as well as Mike Cutler from CAT TV, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity, and we will see you next week. Thanks, Trey. Thanks, Caitlin.